Hey there, healthcare humans. Thank you so much for coming back for another episode of The Other Human in the Room. Okay, so this is my first official podcast back after my summer sabbatical. I'm recording this on the Wednesday of the week that I've returned to work after four weeks away from both my clinical work completely and my coaching work, certainly like not seeing any clients or supporting any clients. Um, I think it's important to put some caveats. I did do a little bit of work still. I did some coaching creative work and I also did some teaching associated with like my faculty. Um, However, it still feels like quite a good sabbatical So much so that I'm already like, I want to do this again next year for sure. And actually next year, let's see if I can even create space away from my teaching work. Like how much can I really take away from my regular rhythms and routines of life just to to notice what happens to me when I do that? So um, I wanted to share, you know, just a bit of, you know, I guess it's a slightly personal update, but as well, I think it has some useful points in it. I want to share what I did um, what, and then what I learned from it in hopes that it is helpful for you to hear that, whether it inspires you to take your own sort of longer sabbatical, you know, um, something that's just for you or something that's a long, longer period of time than you typically would take for yourself. Um, or if you just use some of the ideas that I have been reflecting on and feel like I learned at a deeper level through my sabbatical in your work life. Because that's actually one of the reasons I did it is um, not just so I could have a break and then come back and return to things exactly as they are. My goal was to really learn things so deeply and experience and sort of on an experiential level where as I'm returning, things cannot be the same anymore because I am not the same person. And I have found that to be true so far. I mean, it's obviously very early days. Um, But part of why I want to record this, just like actually all of my podcasts, I record them for you, whomever is listening, but I also record them for me. I often will listen back to some of them to remind myself, what was I thinking at that time? And I can think this one will be important, say in the dead of winter, when I'm, if I have found myself caught up in some old patterns, I could listen to this and be like, right, these were the lessons of the summer sabbatical that I don't want to actually forget. (laughs) So I thought I'd start with just sort of listing some of the things that I did with my time because it was really interesting when I was going away, uh, both patients and like peers and colleagues were like, so what are you going to do with your time off? What do you have planned? And I'd be like, "Um, you know, just a bit of stuff with family. And then otherwise, like the main thing I said is, you know, I want to go like read a book. I want to sit by a beach. I, I want to rest a lot. I basically want to practice being a human being instead of a human doing. That was sort of like the things I would say. And I'm happy to report I did all of those things. I'd made like a little list in my journal. I'm just going to read to you of the things that I did. um, Just to give you a sense and a taste of what my summer sabbatical really looked like. So I did do a bit of like family time and travel. I spent um, two days at one cottage with one side of the family and I think it was four or five days with uh, another side of the family at a different cottage. Um, and I think that was good because that was the first week. And so it was sort of regular vacation time, but also just created natural disruptions into my schedule that were really helpful for me since I, I wanted to ensure that I wasn't trying to still be my normal self and do my normal routines just without work involved. One key thing that I did actually was delete all social media and like log out so it made, and and delete all the apps from my phone, including deleting my email app from my phone, which that one was actually quite major. I didn't realize how often I wanted to check that until I deleted it and was like opening my phone and was like, oh, there's nothing on here for me. So having the cottage at the beginning, that really helped that because it was like I was even less connected to my phone because, you know, there's just so much else distracting me. Um, and um, that, it was interesting, like even just saying for a minute, like my cottage experience, you know, away from home with your two littles plus family and all of the 
I've noticed so much more deeply, like the social conditioning I've received to like act out of obligation when it comes to family. So like putting on a happy face or jumping to what the requests are of different family members. And this year, having done so much like work in sort of connecting with myself and my body on a deeper level and being in like kind of a, I would describe a deep friendship with myself and my body at this point. It wasn't that things didn't get kind of overwhelming, overstimulating, or I didn't have notice old patterns emerge, you know, whatever it may be, but I I had more awareness of it and it felt less intense. Um, I felt more able to say no, even to mothers and mothers-in-laws, for example, (laughs) I found, and I found like, you know, I am going to go take that nap or I am going to take that time to myself. Or when comments were said, I noticed they did were able to kind of fly by in a way that they wouldn't before. So that was sort of neat. I I actually really enjoyed the two cottage experiences more than I have in the past, which um, I really put, I give myself credit and also all those who I um, who have supported me and have been in friendship or coaching relationships or whatever with me. Um, I'm sort of a, a bit of a different person this year than last year is what I've discovered, and and that made my ability to enjoy time with folks that I both love and have tricky relationships with, I was able to enjoy them in a way that I haven't in the past. So that's one thing I did. Um, Another thing I did was see a number of friends for lunch or dinner or ice cream walks, you know, some of whom I've been trying to connect with for some time. Like this year, my two words were like abundance and connection. That was what I wanted to really ensure were a part of my life and that I kind of wanted to use as ways to make decisions throughout this year and the connection part of actually sitting down and like having tea with someone um, when your calendar is very full with clinic and coaching and all the things there's you know friends can fall by the wayside and so it's it was so nourishing to be like okay I'm finally having lunch with that person and making connections that I'm hoping to build on in the fall and in the future um, and I'm really glad that I used my time off to do some of that. Uh, another thing I did was journal every day, except my very, very last day. I did not journal. That was the only one. And that felt really good to me. Not like I had to do it in some strict rule thing. Like I had other things that I was like my first day, I was like, I have an idea. Why don't I do this like Peloton strength program with, you know, that it's four weeks long and then I'll get really strong by the end. And then I very quickly was like, this feels bad and I'm not going to do it. So like (laughs) I started with certain plans that fell away, but one that I was pretty committed to was journaling every day just to like have time with myself and connect with myself. And that felt really good. Sometimes I wrote a couple sentences and sometimes I wrote a few pages and I, I didn't keep myself to anything kind of strict or, forced because the point is that I was resting so it's like hey let's see what comes out if I turn a little bit today and it feels good and it's going to be fun to look back and see like what my thoughts were during this time in the future um though I did like I just said gave I gave up on that Peloton strength program a couple days in basically what happened is I did the thing that I often do where I like went really hard the first few days and then like not injured myself but like basically all my muscles were stiff and sore and terrible And I was like, why do I want to hurt myself, especially in this time of rest? So I did move my body in some way every day, of course, like you always move your body, but I did some intentional movement pretty much every day. One week I did this really fabulous restorative power yoga series. If you're a Peloton person, you should look it up. It's by Ross. Don't remember his last name, but his first name's Ross. It was really great. It was like basically a workshop on embodiment through yoga and it was fabulous. I would do a lot of like walking. I walked outside. I have a little patch of forest near my house and I would often go there without my earbuds in and just like listen to nature and just like forest bathe or whatever you call that. Um, and just moving my body in different ways, whether it was like dancing. Um, I went to a cardio dance concert, which was very fun. Um, the fitness marshal, if you, you can look him up on YouTube, he came to Toronto and I went to his show, which was like 90 minutes of just like fabulous people who also loved him and also knew most of the moves, just like coordinated, choreographed cardio dance. I was in heaven. It was like can I do this every week? I actually want to look into a dance class this fall because I'm like, I love this. Like, it's just something that feels really good in my body personally. Um, I read two full books just for fun. I'm a pretty fast reader. I could have done more, but like I was realizing the weeks were going on and I had 
put other things in my schedule. And I was like, Joan, you said you had to read a book for fun. So I, you know, sat down for a couple of days on at, outside and inside and at a beach and, and, and read a couple books. Um, I like when people give recommendations of books. So the first book I read was called The Shadow Cabinet by Juno Dawson. I'm actually looking it over on my shelf. It's a sequel to, um, it's going to be a trilogy. Uh, the first one's called Her Majesty's Royal Coven. It was great. It's basically Harry Potter for grown-ups, and especially Harry Potter for like grown-ups who um, don't really jive with J.K. Rowling's turf um, anti-trans politics. <laughs> That's like kind of a spoiler, but not really a spoiler. But like, it was great. They're just like easy, fun reads about a world of magic for grown-up, like grown-up witches and. I just love that kind of stuff. So that was one of them. And the second one I just picked up from like Shoppers Drug Mart, like a local pharmacy. Um, it was like 25% off. And I'm looking at it. It's called Between Us. Oh, and I don't remember how to pronounce her first name because I know it's like a Welsh maybe. It's Mary, but I think you don't pronounce it that way at all. McFarland. Anyway, if you look up Between Us, it was just one of those light beach read, you know, um, kind of a fun premise of a, a woman who realizes her boyfriend isn't um, as cool as she thought, like not like betrayed her in various ways. And then on a journey of almost like it's got a little mystery in it. But then, of course, there's another love interest. It's great. You just like breeze through the pages. Rom-com kind of witty British or English UK style writing. Um so those are the two books I read for fun. I also continued my like book snacking of other various nonfiction books when I felt like it. Um, I read a lot of poetry, which is something that I maybe a past self would have rolled my eyes at me now, but I've actually found certain kinds of poetry in particular, very grounding, very soothing, and just like kind of mm, nourishing. Um, uh, Andrea Gibson being one person who I've picked up a lot of their poetry, I believe their po pronouns are they, them, and just really beautiful writer. Um, and then there's a collection of poems that I am still working my way through. I think it's called something like 50 Poems to Change Your View of the World. Uh-oh. I'll put links to all of this in the podcast, um, but the, it's curated by Padre Gotuma, who also he hosts a podcast called Poetry Unbound, where in his like absolutely delicious Irish accent, he reads poet, he'll read a poem, and then he'll kind of like dissect it. And because and he's a poet himself, he'll like kind of talk about the themes he hears and what's inspired to him. And then he reads it again at the end. That's how, how the podcast goes. And the book is basically the same thing. So you'll like read the poem, and then you'll read his sort of like what came up for him. And it's really interesting. It's like, it's taught me a lot about like, the different kinds of poems but not in a dry way in a way that's very alive and interesting and like just connects you with your humanity so that's if you are a book snacker poems are great for that because they are short <laughs> and especially for me because I don't really have any training in like understanding how to look for the depths of hidden depths of a poem um that one book was really helpful because then someone who does know how to do that would like explain some of it to me and I would find that very lovely um, what else is on this list? Oh, yes. Completely avoided Instagram, which I'm very proud of myself for doing, honestly, because it's the one that I can I can spend some time on there. Um, and I did peek at Facebook a handful of times because some things I was still like programs I was still a part of were on Facebook. But I noticed how it felt in my body when I would go back and just remind myself. I think the thing about social media in general is when you're in it, it's like a full body experience. Like basically it's designed to engage you in a way as if you've suddenly entered a conversation with other humans and, you know, 50 million other humans, you know, and that has an effect on your body. It's not that it's good or bad, but just like noticing that. So when I'm like before, I would like be doing that to myself many times a day whenever I would check in on social media and then have my attention pulled back to the real here and now present moment. And so being away from that, then when I would peek at social media, I'd be like, oh, wow, this is really now I feel like I've been transported to another realm. I could feel like a teleportation almost, you know, um, and so that's good to notice. It means that as I've reactivated my social media accounts before I go on them, I'm like, hey, why am I teleporting at this moment? Am I actually intentional about why I'm connecting with social media or is this like trying to escape, you know, and I, I've noticed I have a bit more bandwidth to kind of say, oh, maybe I actually don't need to check it right now. And that's been really nice. 
another thing I did was take a lot of naps and even just like lie downs, like my rest practice, I would lie and that would feel good. Um, oh, something I forgot to mention is that I sang quite a bit. There's an app that I love called, I think it's called Simply Sing. Um, it's basically kind of like a karaoke app and it will tell you if you're like on the tune or not. It's supposed to teach you how to sing, but it doesn't. But like, it's got a lot of fun pop songs on there and singing, especially like belting out with no one listening is another like embodiment thing for me. And, um, that was great. So in the middle of the day, just like say a time that I normally like want to go scroll social media, it's like, well, clearly my body's craving a shift or connection. What can I do? I'll sing a Kelly Clarkson song, thanks. And so that was really fun. Um, I did go to the beach like I promised myself. Um, I went to the movies by myself. I saw the Barbie movie like on my own on a like random Monday afternoon and it was so good. Both the experience of it and also the movie itself is like high quality. It's like excellent. Um, I spent a full day watching like an entire season of a TV show. It was it was called Jury Duty. I'm saying all the names of things. Is that fun? I like when people say what they did. It was a good show. It's like a, the premise of the show is fun. It's like reality show with a comedy show mixed together. Um, and I spent an entire day doing that, which is something I used to like, you know, binge watch TV quite a bit, especially in university, you know, and it was interesting like doing that and feeling that the what was pleasurable about that, but also then noticing how at the end of the day, I didn't have the same level of say like satisfaction or like nourishment or like it didn't stick with me in a way that actually felt like refreshing. And so it was useful, like giving myself permission to do it. And then also giving myself permission not to keep doing it because not because I, I was bad or it was bad, but like, yeah, I can see why I don't do this very many days, but once in a blue moon, it's a good time. Um, I also went to Toronto twice for that cardio concert and also to see some good friends right at the end, which was very fun. And, uh, oh, and I, the one thing I did that was technically work related, but felt really good to do was like created a bunch of content for my upcoming group course that's about to start in a couple of weeks. Um, and that felt so good. I felt like I had space and energy. I spent like one full day kind of like creating a bunch of video content and writing it and, it just felt really delicious to do it that way instead of having to like kind of fit it in and do it in a frantic way because I just had so much space and time to do it, you know? So those are the things I did. You know, I just wanted to kind of (laughs) say what were a bunch of things that I've done. And um, yeah, like from that, I think, I feel like I've got a good solid list now. Like what are the things that actually ground me and connect me with myself and my body more versus other things that I tried say like the watching TV or the peeking at social media, um, eating more than I was hungry for. Those were other things I did that felt good in the moment that I noticed didn't actually follow through on actually connecting me on a deeper level that ended up sort of having a lasting effect. Um, and I feel like that was useful to kind of generate, like what was, what was more nourishing than something else? Um, and that actually leads really well into my first lesson. I have, I think, six lessons that I wrote down that I want to share with you. Like, so those were the things I did. So what did I learn from having all of those different experiences? And the first thing I learned is there's, there does not have to be any such thing as a guilty pleasure. Like guilty pleasure is an optional notion that we all pass around to each other, but it really is a pretty inhuman story because it's baked into this idea that actually, especially for those of us socialized female, but for everybody that to enjoy something is a little bit sinful. You should feel guilty if you enjoy it too much. If you feel too much pleasure, you're maybe doing something a little wrong, a little bad, a little sinful, you know? And I'm just like, not about that. And that's one of the things I really gave myself permission to do is like, hey, if you're having a craving, if you having a, I was having a craving to sit and watch TV all day, I was recovering from a cold and I was like, you know what, I had some other ideas and I'm just going to do this. And giving myself full permission without the like, oh, is this bad? Is this good? Like, oh, it just, felt, it did feel good. You know, I def, I learned about what feels good and then has like kind of, la- and then lasts, you know, it's like, um. I hear folks on the internet, like on Instagram, who are about like how to 
how to raise our kids to speak about food in a way that's not going to lead to disordered eating. <laughs> um, and so it's about not saying that sugar is bad, like, and saying some food is healthy and some food is unhealthy and, you know, all of that. But instead, the phrase I like is like, things have different foods have different kinds of energy in them. And so say like a piece of candy has a lot of a very fast kind of energy. So it gets into your system fast and you use that energy up very fast, but then you're probably hungry a little while later because it like it kind of burns through your system very quickly. And so it's not about that being good or bad, but we want a mix of the kinds of energy so that, you know, especially, and we'd especially kind of want to focus on the kinds of energy that are going to give us energy throughout the day. So I think about that with food and what I eat, but I also think about that in like experiences I invite myself to have. So watching an episode of TV, sometimes it can be long lasting if it's like a really high quality, deep, impactful moment. Probably if it's the kind of show or if I'm in the kind of space where I'm noticing I'm watching many, many episodes in a row, um, I notice that it, it definitely like doesn't pay dividends. Like it, it has a depreciative effect where I'm sort of like, oh, I, I just need something more like it's like that hit that craving you know people use the addiction analogy for that reason and same with social media if I peek on I see a couple really inspiring things and then I know ah I'm that felt good I feel good having done that and now I'm ready to move on right those I would say though um, are two examples for me personally and I am definitely not saying if there are examples for you I I think there's some of this stuff that may have, that are we're likely to overlap with just as human beings and human bodies that there's certain things that if most of us spend a lot of our times doing we'll have similar reactions in our body but i am so not about saying this is good for you this is bad for you this is the routine you do to have a perfect beautiful enlightened life no i'm so not about that right so say for a lot of us say how we use social media, especially if we're on and we're scrolling a lot. Well, notice we may enjoy it for a while, but we stop enjoying it. And that doesn't make it a guilty pleasure or not, though. The guilt and the shame we may feel afterwards, that's like, it just ends up kicking us in the butt. So then we feel even more depleted and then are more likely to go back to those sorts of activities again, right? So if instead of thinking of this is a thing that's good for me, this is a thing if that's bad for me, instead thinking like, well, what kind of energy does this have in it? So the things I've noticed that give me more longer lasting energy are like a lot of the things that I just described. So poetry, dancing, singing, napping, or just lying down, walking in the forest without earbuds, sitting outside on my porch, just in general, but especially if it's raining, Mm. laughing, journaling, orgasming, yoga, running, uh, what's this last one? Oh, lying in the sun on a beach or in the grass. Yes, that's my list. I wrote a list. I'm like, I have to remember. These are the things that I've noticed. They they give me a kind of pleasure that especially since I've done de-socializing or not that I'm finished, but you know, I've, I've greatly um, deconditioned the guilt. These are things that I purely enjoy and that have the kind of energy that lasts versus other things I can absolutely still enjoy, like seeing a movie, going on social media, gossiping. Those are ones that I notice, hmm, they can feel really yummy, but I notice that their aftertaste and the level of energy they bring me long term, it fades fast and I end up craving a little more. So it's something that I'm still happy to do from time to time, but I probably am not going to make like the main course of my diet every day, you know? And so that's the way that I've reframed the whole guilty pleasure thing. Like if I'm enjoying it, I'm enjoying it, period. I allow myself to enjoy it all the way through and see then if I can get to a point of satisfaction and move on. And that's the second lesson. So the first lesson is there's no such thing as a guilty pleasure. The second lesson is that I am actually satisfiable. Because I remember I was going through this like kind of guided journal um, by Adrienne Marie Brown and Sonia Renee Taylor called... Oh, what is it called? Uh, the Journal of Radical Permission, maybe? Yikes. Um, something like that. And one of the questions I asked is like, are you satisfiable? And I was like, uh-oh, maybe I'm not because I can hustle. And I, I, there's ways, you know, um, you know, being unsatisfiable, if you are familiar with the musical Hamilton, you know, Hamilton could never be satisfied. He was always going for so much and he had a big impact in the, in the world because he was never satisfied. He just needed more and things needed to be better. Like I get how that gets kind of praised, but especially say 
with things that are a part of your daily life. Like if I'm never able to be satisfied in a social connection, if I'm never able to be satisfied is how I look, if I'm never be able to be satisfied about how I feel, satisfied about what I'm eating, right? It can lead to a kind of un- malignant hunger that that means I'm not actually enjoying my life. I can't, you can't really enjoy what you can't be satisfied by, right? So I put that as one of the main intentions of this sabbatical was, I want to practice satisfaction, which means tuning in. So say I'm eating something. Oh, am I full? Am I satisfied? Okay, then I'm going to stop. Oh, like I'm reading this book. Ooh, am I at a point of satisfaction where I'm feeling like, ha, that was enough for today. Okay, then I'll put it down and move on, right? And I was surely not perfect at it because no such thing. But I would notice times where I was like, woo, I went past the point of satisfaction and was kind of just doing it to do it or out of habit or to kind of run away or escape from another feeling I was avoiding versus when I was just in it to enjoy it and be satisfied by it. I just think that was a useful lesson for me to learn is that I can be satisfied. (laughs) And I do want to take that as a practice. So into my work, like working yesterday, it's like, could I practice being satisfied with what I did with each of my patients, knowing there's always more, there's always something else, but like, could I be satisfied by that? So the third lesson that I learned in my summer sabbatical um, is that prioritizing time in nature is essential for me. So one thing that I am getting curious about um, is how can I tweak my schedule to create time outside in the fresh air? I think whether it's actually that at the beginning and the end of my day, I just like make sure I take time, like get out of my van and before I go into work, I like do take a walk. I think in the middle of the day, going for a quick walk around the block could be good. I did not start that yesterday, but this is the reason I want to record this podcast because I think it's something that will feel good to add into the middle of my day instead of like grinding all the way through, you know, even though it feels less like grinding than it used to. I think something about nature and fresh air I'm just curious what it will feel like to add it into my work, especially days when I would normally be on my computer all day or with patients all day. So that's something I'm reminding myself because it's just like, I, you just feel more alive when you're next to a tree. At least for me, it is like, there's a reason my tattoo is three trees. Like I love trees and being in nature, you just like, remember that you're an animal because we are animals and we pretend we're not and there's something about how we are often inside and away from the things that remind us of what we are connected to on a fundamental level that it it was super therapeutic to go back to and I want to have an intention to bring that into my regular working routine for sure. A super important lesson that I, I wanted to learn in a real embodied concrete way by going on my sabbatical and that I want to learn on deeper levels ongoing forever is that I am replaceable at work. So my patients receive good care without me, with me and without me. That's like, if that's one of my favorite mantras is that that is true. My patients receive good care from many sources, including me, but many, many more. And like being away for the full month and that the dividends and rewards and harvest of that I received back like yesterday at my first full day. And just like the number of people who, who mentioned seeing one or both of the nurse practitioners who I have hired to actually watch my practice all the time. And then for this past month, they've been the ones caring for my patients. Um, They had such lovely things to say about them. And also, even if they didn't have lovely things to say, which no one yesterday did, but say they had like, guess what? They still got care. Whether their opinion of it is that, you know, they think that we have to have a monogamous clinical relationship. I'm exploring polyamory in my clinical work, if you will. But really just the sense of like, I'm so grateful to be a part of these teams, like coming back and having a very slim inbox and having all this beautiful care offered to my patients with in my absence was like, so glorious honestly I can't say that enough so like just strong recommend doing it for that reason because we can get so like in our heads and have so much ownership like it's got to be done this way my way and that's the only way and like I get why we do that and it, it can come from like these are my values this is how I this what this is what feels good to offer my patients and the thing is like it can feel really good for you to be really clear about how you offer care to your patients and 
when that starts to mean that you're the only one who can offer care because you're just the only kind of good care to offer, just double check that that's not an inhuman story because in my experience, it is an inhuman story and a little bit like, a little bit supremacist, right? And I'm not, I say that very lightly and, and with love and to myself because there's some things where I'm still like, obviously my way is the best. And um, it's something I'm really let, learning to let go of because there's so many good ways. And actually the more good ways we can find, I'm not saying there's not bad ways. There are some really not great ways. Thankfully, those that I have hired do not practice in those bad ways. I think that's why we resonate so well with each other because our styles are similar enough that it's not discordant, but like everyone has their own spin and it's, I don't even know what I would have decided on some of the days with some of the clinics, but they decided beautiful things and did so much beautiful work. And I was like, wow, like, I just love it. I learned things from it, you know? So working on a team, so good. Hiring a locum when you go away, so good. For nothing else, just to remind yourself, you are replaceable. We are all replaceable. We will all retire someday. We all get sick. We all go on leaves. Like, it's part of it. So it can't be that we think we're the one and only clinician for our patients. That's a really heavy setup and it's not fair to us or to our patients actually. So the second last thing, number five, that I learned was that I really love my work, especially when I set aside like the pressure. I really do enjoy it and I, and I missed it. I started to miss my patients. So that's how you know you've been away a long time when you're like, oh man, I miss them. I'm so looking forward to seeing them. And it's okay if you're not looking forward to seeing all of them in equal measure, right? But some of them, it's a, sometimes quite a relief to have someone else take a peek at them and just see what's going on. But like, just in general, like I miss my staff, I miss my clinic. Um, and that's how I knew I'd been away for enough time. And I definitely miss coaching. And I hadn't gotten burnt out with coaching, but definitely I had been doing a lot of coaching and it had felt really good. And it had felt just about time to put it down because I, I could see myself, I enjoy it so much. I could see that desire to keep going and going forever, but nothing, some, nothing you're supposed to do forever. You're supposed to have seasons for everything. And so sort of pushing myself to have a season of stepping away from like one-on-one -on -one coaching was like, really good and now i feel really resourced to i have um three one-on-one -on -one clients for the fall so far and then i have my group program that's gonna have i believe eight people in it and like ha huh, that feels great that's gonna be a great number of humans to connect with and support and because i've taken this time away it's feeling really good um and then the last lesson is sabbaticals or whatever you want to call them, extended times away from work, ideally by myself for chunks of it, for sure. They really should be mandatory. Honestly, like why is that not part of our culture period? You know, I kind of like teachers, I get what you got going on there. Though I, maybe teachers then fill their summer with other things and don't actually relax, relax and take time for themselves. But like the jobs we do in healthcare are extremely like high performance, dependent like we have to have our brains on right we have to have our like empathy on right we got like we don't have to and in fact many of us most of us are in some level of depletion with that and we still do okay work but like you know this is the care of other humans bodies like why wouldn't we assume that the bodies caring for the other bodies need time to themselves need time for rest and restoration and resourcing like it's so wild that we don't have this as like you're only allowed to work 11 months out of the year or something i would love if that's became the norm and the culture and um you know the system was resourced enough we had enough people in here we had enough uh, you know systems in place that that was not only encouraged, but in some ways planned for maybe even mandatory. That's, that's where I'm dreaming. That's like the reality I'd love to come true, honestly. Um, and so for me, I've decided to make it mandatory for myself. So I absolutely want to take the same amount of time next summer. I'm thinking about also maybe, I don't know if it would be a full month, but like taking a maybe a full week off for like my birthday every year and have that be like, maybe I go away or something or I don't know. Like I haven't fully figured that out, but like another chunk of time in the middle of the winter, my, my birthday's in February. So like chunk of time in the winter where I do a similar little sabbatical again, just to be like, I'm replaceable. Um, 
my rest and restoration and bodily needs matter and really just to disrupt because like when you're at work i could feel okay all the desires all the requests all the needs you know yes expectations are opinions but they start to feel like obligations if we're in it too long like we have to yes we can work on reconfiguring what our environments look like when we're at work so it's less like that that's my whole thing and one of the ways i think we could always get the perspective we need to learn how we can tweak it further is by fully removing ourselves from just like our daily routines you know whatever we think we have to do burn it all to the ground and say look i didn't have to do any of that and i was fine i fed myself i gave myself water to drink i used the toilet i slept I move my body like those are, you know I talk to a human like are those the ba- the five basic functions that a person actually needs and everything on top of that can't be a need to have to must should you know so finding time out separate from that I think is quite essential and so that's my plan moving forward and I'm saying it all out loud to you to make it so um and so with that I had um a thought about if anyone would want support to ensure they get their summer sabbatical next year whether it's in the summer or not you know um this past year i did uh this little coaching program operation enjoy your summer it was really fun i promoted it for a week and i think that was not a long enough time for people to decide if they wanted to do it or not and i had two people sign up which was fabulous and i actually got together with them and um had lunch with them when i was in toronto and that was like amazing and I was thinking, like, would some, would folks want that if I if I offered something like that? Um, I really would like to know. It's it's a it's a feels like optional to me. It's something that I think I would I would be happy to offer and kind of host. I actually have another coach who does work in kind of the money goal setting space that I'm thinking would be a great collaborator, and so we could kind of offer it together, and you'd get two coaches and. Um, whether it's like a series of workshops, whether it's like a proper coaching program, I don't know. So uh, this isn't like a, a formal offer, you know, but it is something I've been thinking about. And so if you listen to this and you're like, you know what, everything Joan was talking about, maybe you're like, I wouldn't want to do any of the things she did while she was on sabbatical, but the idea of being away from my work for four weeks sounds amazing and I would go do this, but I could never. Like, especially if you're in that space and you're like, but what if I could? and you would like some support around that, um, I think what I'm going to do is in the show notes of this podcast, and probably like if you peep my social media and my website and look for like this podcast page, I'm going to put like a Google form there. And so if you, if that's something you're like, you know what, I would, I'd be interested in learning more. This is not a commitment. You don't have to sign up right now, but like, I'm interested in learning more of what this would look like. Um, I would love to offer it for you because I know that I needed it and offering it to others and having the two people sign up really solidified that I was really doing it. And that was really helpful for me. And I know, I believe it was helpful for them too. So um, if you're interested in doing that, uh, check the show notes and check my website, like the podcast part of my website. And um, yeah, you know, only sign up if you think you might be interested and, um, then I will, e- at a later date, sometime this fall, I will email you if there's been enough interest that we, we might do Operation Enjoy Your Summer Part 2. And if not, that's totally good. Like, one of the things I'm really interested in is um, offering things on this podcast and also, like, the additional things that I do, like, coaching-wise, like programs, workshops, etc. I really want to make sure there are things that are of interest and um, are kind of addressing the top of mind highest struggles and interests that you who are listening have and so if you ever have another idea of like what would be interesting to you whether it's like a topic for the podcast or something you're like oh would you ever do a workshop on this or are you ever considering doing this like please feel free to like dm me on social media or hit me up on uh you know contact me through my website and i'm happy to hear all of those ideas because i would love to spend my time doing things that are really meaningful for others as well as myself you know Um, so yeah, that's it for this week. Um, I hope you can reflect back on this summer, whether you took a whole chunk of time off or not, but really sitting down and being like, what did I do? And what did I learn from it? Including maybe it can be from things that feel so positive and you don't want to forget, but it could also be like, I, I learned that 
this is the last summer I want to take time away without finding a locum. Or this is the last time I want to not take a single week of vacation for the summer or whatever it is. Like I learned that I'm never going to spend that extended period of time with my (laughs) in-laws, whatever it is. That's not one of mine, but it could be yours, right? So it's like making a regular practice about like reflecting back over your past and then asking yourself, what lessons have you learned from it? It helps you not repeat history, especially if it's a part of history you don't want to repeat again, you know? So if you feel if you feel called to, please share whatever lessons you've learned. I would love to hear. And uh, yeah, otherwise, have a wonderful week rooting for you wherever you are in healthcare. And I will talk to you next week.